And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, really give an overview of, of both external and internal research data um, looking at inactivated PERS vaccines. And again, typically I'm with Behringer, and so we're an MLB company. But having said that, I think everybody in this room's had direct experience with MLBs, so I'm going to try something different today and talk about everything except MLBs. Um, because really, you know, they are tools, but they're not magic bullets. And so as a research company, we continue to look at other options, and, and that includes options other than MLB. And so I'm going to give you a summary of control data that we, as well as external people, have done looking at autogenous, commercial killed, extract vaccines, uh, really not looking at vaccine at all, trying to modulate the immune system to control PERS, and then I'm going to end up with some DNA vaccine work. The first uh, paper, I was not involved with at all, but it's really sort of the, I'll call it the grandfather of comparison studies. It was done by Dr. Osorio uh, in the late 90s, looking at uh, autogenous vaccine as well as uh, two mo different modified lab vaccines. And this information was published at the Lehman, so if you want to go back and see the details of this, you can. Um, but basically it was uh, two MLVs, an autogenous challenge controls, and a strict control, really, really standardized study. And uh, what you can see is that, so the mouse here. You know, if you look at the non-vaccinates non and non-challenged, they had 90% pigs born alive and then weaned alive. Both the MLVs were about the same in the 50 to 60% range, so there was some partial protection. I believe this was statistically uh, significant. And then if you look at the uh, challenge controls and the autogenous, Really, there was very little protection and certainly no, no obvious protection due to the autogenous vaccine. And their conclusion was, as I stated, no statistical difference in the infection on in the control group that did not receive vaccination and the autogenous killed. They went on then to say that there was some partial protection provided by both, both NLVs, but it was not sterilizing. Uh, also, uh, in the early 90s, we were approached by Dr. Han Su Ju at the University of Minnesota, who also had an idea and a concept about ways to improve an inactivated vaccine. So him and Dr. Eric Vaughn um, did three trials looking at what they called a PERS extract vaccine. This extract vaccine looks, uh, when I look at the MJ website, similar. It's based on an early harvest, not on viable virus, and then there's a Tritonex detergent extract, and the idea was to, to really concentrate and amplify the immune response on antigens prior to virus assembly. And so they used a reproductive model. They used two doses of vaccine um, during breeding with a challenge at 90 days of age. They used a homologous uh, challenge uh, and then compared uh, the extract and autogenous as well as the commercial product in that Fairway model. And again, what you can quickly see is that the controls that did not receive challenge, sorry, this computer is haunted, um, had uh, growing performances above 80-90%. However, all of the inactivated groups looked uh, were significantly lower and similar to the challenge controls and all had farrowing performance of around 20% viable pigs at 28 days of age. That included the uh, Triton extract, two different preparations, or two different adjuvanted materials, and a autogenous vaccine. And at that time, there was a commercial killed vaccine, I think, that was sold by Bayer. And um, typically, when, when I talk to people who uh, are proponents of killed vaccines, they like to talk about it in combination with some other immune exposure, whether it be L LVI or MLV. And so we've tested that as well. In this study, an MLV vaccine was used. The vaccine was administered prior to breeding, and then two KB vaccines were given post-breeding with a challenge at 90 days of, of gestation with a, uh, uh, I believe this is actually a heterologous challenge. Um, on the far left, the I stands for Engelvac, Engelvac plus killed, Engelvac only. KV only challenge and negative controls. As you can see, with the negative controls, we had 68% of the animals still alive and healthy at 21 days of age. In contrast, both the killed and the challenge controls were both around 10% viability, and they were significantly lower. Both groups that received the modified live were significantly better than challenge controls, 
And as you can see, the addition of the killed vaccine did not seem to have either a numerical or a statistical benefit. So again, in a reproductive model, um, KV vaccine alone did not seem to provide efficacy. MLV did, and the addition of KV to that did not seem to have a lot of benefit. That was a respiratory model. As Bob said, there's uh, some debate what, what's the right model. We've also done a similar study, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's been published, but we looked at a very similar protocol in a respiratory model, and this was done by Dr. Halber and presented in 1999. MLV was administered one time at three weeks of age. An autogenous vaccine was produced and administered at three and six weeks of age, and then we had a combination MLV followed by a booster with autogenous um, challenge at nine weeks of age, the challenge would have been homologous to the killed antigen and heterologous to the MLV. Serologically, you can see that the two groups that received MLV had a typical serologic response, and no surprise there. You can also see that the uh, blue line that received killed only, there was a measurable group average in terms of, of humoral immunity relative to OR7. But you can also see that if you look at the challenge controls, we had 47% gross pneumonia. Both groups that had um, modified live were significantly less at 6 and 8%. And the autogenous vaccine, although it was numerically lower, was not statistically different. Again, in this model, the MLV did work. In addition to the KB did not provide any statistically significant benefit and there was no statistical significance of having a killed vaccine alone in that respiratory challenge. This is actually a, a relatively recent paper. I got these slides from Dr. Rosario, and it's actually one of my favorites because it sort of uh, demonstrates the complexity of PERS uh, that we face today. It also gives us a whole different set of tools that we don't work with on a, a daily basis. And they used a modified live vaccine that's available only in Europe. And they also use a killed vaccine that's commercially available in Europe. And so uh, it's nice to see whether the Europeans are a lot smarter than us and know what, what's going on. Uh, their primary parameter of efficacy in this trial was viremia. They felt that if you reduced viremia, everything else would go along with it. And so that was the focus of their, of their study. And I'm not, this is a busy slide. I'm not going to go into it in great detail. It's in the uh, proceedings that you have. But basically, the MLV was given at two doses on day 0 and 21. The killed vaccine was also given on day 0 and 21. And then they did a variety of, of measurements. The first thing that's really interesting uh, as you read through this paper is on day 28, the day of challenge, there is no SN response. However, after challenge, you'll see that the killed vaccine actually has a, a measurable and statistically significant increase in neutralization tigers which, you know, if you read the literature, that would seem like a pretty positive first step. Also, if you look at uh, PERS-specific interference secreting cells, if you look at day 28, again, the kill vaccine has a response superior to the MLV. So as I'm reading this paper, I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, this looks like it could be a pretty good vaccine. Unfortunately, you turn the page, and you see that the MLV basically had no viremia, almost, uh, in this paper, sterilizing immunity. They don't, they don't say that, but I mean, in, in the data time points that they looked at, they had no recoverable virus. And as you can see, despite the very nice immune responses, the killed vaccine was loaded with virus. So that's pretty frustrating. And again, their conclusion, the only type of vaccine that elicited protective immunity against PERS was the attenuated live. The killed vaccine did not evoke a measurable level of protective immunity. So far, I've talked mostly about vaccines. Um, we've sort of taken a different slant. Maybe it's not the antigen, but maybe you could modulate the immune response of the host to try to drive better immunity no matter what the vaccine you put in. And so we, we tested various cytokines and immunomodulators to try to affect that. And we looked at adjuvants, uh, the specific one we call HS. We also looked at um, the idea of homologous immunity or trying to broaden the immunity. So we used baculovirus and created a pool of five purified or five antigens and made a cocktail. And those five were based on the most diverse that we had available to us, hoping that if we immunized with those, we would broaden our immunity. Interferon alpha is a known and published antiviral. Um, 
we threw the kitchen sink at this. We used, we had a DNA vaccine that expressed interferon alpha from Zuckerman in Illinois. In addition, each animal received $5,000 per dose worth of uh, recombinant interferon, and they received both of those treatments. Um, we used poly ICLC, which is a, uh, something that the human industry is experimenting with. Also, an interferon inducer has antiviral activity. Interleukin 12, again, recombinant injection, several, th several thousand dollars per animal of interleukin 12 to try to drive killer and natural killer cells. And then we threw in an OR5, uh, basically a subunit vaccine that had a cholera toxin adjuvant. Uh, vaccination at three weeks of age. Um, the, the cholera toxin group was inactivated, so it was, it was done at two doses. Heterogous challenge on, on, with a 184 on day 55. This is pretty interesting. If you look at the challenge controls, you'll see there's 36% pneumonia in this model. And if you look at the MLB, the MLB plus the adjuvant, and then the interleukin-12 groups, those are all statistically different and lower than the challenge controls. You'll see some other groups that have MLB and have some additive to them actually seem to make the results worse or less variable. And I just want to point out one other observation. This is one study, but we've, we've noted this uh, three, maybe four times. When we have tried to develop vaccines that are based just on OR5, in four or four times, we've exacerbated disease, which uh, is surprising to us, but it's reproducible in our hands. You can see that the MLV that had the ORF5 to it actually took a vaccine that did work and made it not work, and it was uh, very similar to the challenge controls. And you can also see that our cholera toxin killed vaccine uh, really provided uh, no efficacy whatsoever and was numerically worse. So again, the only three treatment groups that provided benefit were the uh, adjuvated and interleukin-12. So we do continue to look at interleukin-12 as a potential, uh, but we're not focusing on, on any of those other ideas. And as I said, this is a highly experimental deal. E each treatment group was, this was nothing commercially viable. We were just doing this for scientific purposes because each animal received several thousand dollars worth of uh, cytokine. And finally, I just want to give you an overview of some work we're doing with DNA vaccines. The concept with DNA vaccines is you can inject DNA into the host under the control of a promoter. That DNA gets taken up by a host cell and actually expresses it as if it were a virus. And so the, the theory behind it would be it, it would have the immunity and antigen produced of a live virus without any potential for shedding. Um, and so it's a great research tool, and so we jumped in. This is work done by uh, Dr. Eric Vaughn. And what Eric did was he created a series of, of constructs and clones that basically cover the entire genome. ORF1 is huge, and so he had to make clones, and he's got those labeled A through M. It took him all of those different clones to cover ORF1, and then he had individual plasmids that covered 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, 7. So basically, he had the entire genome that he could inject. It wouldn't replicate, but potentially could induce immunity. This study was uh, also a respiratory model, three-week-old pigs. Uh, DNA vaccines generally do require multiple doses, and so in this trial we used two doses. Uh, MLV was put in as a positive control on day zero, uh, challenged on day 35. And here we are, challenge controls had about 12% pneumonia in this trial. Our positive control was Engelvac and was statistically lower at below 2%. However, uh, this was promising in that both of the plasmid groups, or the DNA vaccine groups, had a significant reduction from challenge controls. They were in the 4 to uh, 7 region. Uh, they were significantly higher than MLV, but they were significantly better than challenge controls. If you break this data out, there's actually animals within that group that are in the 0 to 2 percent range. We had just a lot of variation, which, which skewed the average up. But in general, it looked like this technology did work. But again, not quite as consistently as MLB. And so just to end, um, I heard this quote once, and it was, bring forth your finest warriors, let them do battle, and may the victor be recognized. And I thought that was pretty found. I didn't know if it was something about like a gladiator or what it was, but basically it was Dr. Reed Phillips, and I said, geez, Reed, that's pretty profound. Where did you hear that? And Reed says, well, I just read this article in Shap, and basically Mike Murtaugh and Bob Rowland and the Purse Cap group have suggested that vaccines should be tested in standardized protocols 
and standardized measures. And as an organization, we think that's a great idea and are very supportive of that. So in conclusion, we've done a lot of studies looking at uh, inactivated vaccines or, or vaccines other than MLV. In, in our controlled studies, we have yet to see anything that consistently provides any statistically significant benefit uh, when used either alone or in combination with MLV or LBI. Uh, attempts to enhance immunity have been difficult. A lot of variation within treatment groups despite all animals being treated the same way. And as Bob said, we do think new technologies will come to the swine industry for PERS. We think it's going to be incremental step forwards and probably not magic bullets. And in conclusion, I need to thank some people, especially Dr. Osorio. Dr. Osorio has probably done as much on inactivated vaccines as anybody, and uh, he provided me with slides from several of his trials. So thank you very much.